Uh, hello, I'm Dr. Rout Rygart. I'm chairman of the board of Beyond Pesticides um, and a professor emeritus of pediatrics. That means I'm a pediatrician uh, from the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our pre-conference meeting, which we call Pesticides 101, which is uh, a way of giving you some background about uh, pesticides to lead into the rest of the meeting. Uh, and we hope you'll attend all of our four uh, days of meetings. Um, broadly speaking, uh, the first two are gonna be more talking about the effects of pesticides and the second two more about uh, how we uh, can get pesticides out of our environment and move to more sustainable systems that are free of pesticides. Um, I, I, this is a good time to remind you that um, pesticides, um, the second half of the word pesticide, which is side means to kill. Uh, and all pesticides uh, are meant to kill something. And what we know very well is that no pesticides kill only what they're intended to kill. And one of the reasons to uh, get away from pesticides is the fact that they um, do lots of things uh, in many systems that they're not intended to do uh, and thereby disrupt uh, the basic ecology. Um, and you'll hear as this conference goes on, some of the ways that our ecology is damaged uh, by pesticides. So the goal beyond pesticides is to make sure that we have a healthy, sustainable environment, uh, being aware of the overall ecology of systems. Uh, we are based in science. Uh, nothing that we talk about or promote with regard to getting beyond pesticides um, is not um, based on sound science. And um, as a pediatrician, an academic pediatrician, um, it's critical to me and to all the things I do that whatever we do is based on sound science. Um, however, um, we do uh, get involved in political systems um, because uh, our ability to um, change from a pesticide chemical intensive um, society uh, to a pesticide free society uh, requires that we interact with political systems. And you hear a little bit, particularly in the sessions that are involved with solutions, um, ways in which we use the sound science to influence political systems on a national, state and local basis. Um, we, um, in, in thinking about um, pesticides and their effects, um, you can go at it from several directions. Um, one that is um, commonly done and that you read about in your newspapers um, is looking at the epidemiology of pesticides um, and their effects upon people, animals, and other systems. So uh, the epidemiology is sort of the broad view. Um, however, uh, it's very important to us to go beyond the broad view and look at, at a biologic uh, mechanistic basis, how these effects that we see in the broader uh, societal or, or ecological view uh, are affected. So we're interested not only uh, in the effects of pesticides on the ecology environment, uh, but also why they occur, um, because this uh, makes us better understand biologic systems and the effects of pesticides that are not what we would like to see. Let's welcome Carolyn Cox, board member of Beyond Pesticides, formerly senior scientist, Center for Environmental Health, Eugene, Oregon.
Thank you, Jay. And thanks to all of you who are joining this uh, discussion this today. Uh, the title of my presentation is 10 Reasons Not to Use Pesticides. And um, for those of you who have attended the forum before, um, you may well have heard this presentation. Hopefully there's new information for you. It's really primarily intended to help uh, people who are new to the issue to understand some of the important hazards with pesticide use, and also to help people who've worked on pesticides for a long time, but are looking for new convincing reasons to um, help with uh, when they're talking to decision makers or neighbors or whoever. Um, the first of my 10 reasons is pesticides don't solve pest problems. This is probably the crucial issue about pesticides, but it's one that people may not have talked thought about a lot. When you think about a pesticide, you think, yeah, that kills pests, right? And yes, pesticides are really good at killing pests. What they're not so good at is solving pest problems. Um, if pesticides really solve pest problems, we probably wouldn't need to use them anymore, right? But instead, we use, you know, over a billion pounds a year and have for many decades. Um, some pesticides use has actually increased dramatically in the last few decades. So how do we solve pest problems? These are probably things you've heard about. Put screens on the windows, caulk any openings, um, use uh, sweeps and other things to make sure doors are tightly fitting. Um, escutcheons, if you haven't heard that wonderful word, um, it's just a little device to go around the place where a pipe goes through the wall so that no little pests can get through. Um, keeping food in jars, cleaning up your pet after he or she has eaten, um, making sure that pests don't have a place to get water. So using bathroom fans and other fans, fixing any leaky plumbing, um, cleaning often more carefully than useful, usual. So vacuuming, scrubbing. Um, and then there are things, um, you know, out in our yard, there's beneficial insects that actually eat pests. Um, there's things that farmers can do um, using compost to build healthy soil, um, choosing varieties that don't get attacked by pests so much, uh, growing green manure crops, another way to build a healthy soil, um, growing diverse crops so that um, <clears throat> pests that are associated with a single crop can't do so well. Um, reason number two is that pesticides are hazardous to our health. Um, and this is a um, surprisingly controversial statement, um, but even actually the EPA agrees that pesticides can have important effects on human health. Um, what I'm gonna do is just quickly run through um, three very widely used pesticides and um, just quickly go through what um, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health says about um, health hazards. Um, so the first one is glyphosate or Roundup, which you probably all heard about. It's the most widely used herbicide in the country. NIOSH um, has compiled 11 studies showing that it damages genes and four studies showing that it causes birth defects. Um, in addition, the International Agency for Research on Cancer um, says it probably causes cancer. Um, Acephate is a widely used insecticide, about 4 million pounds a year. Again, um, NIOSH has compiled a lot of information, 13 studies showing that it damages genes, four studies showing that it reduces fertility, and one study showing that it causes birth defects. Um, chlorothalonil um, is the most widely used fungicide, about 11 million pounds a year. Again, NIOSH has compiled a lot of information about health hazards. 
um, 10 studies that it causes genes, one for fertility, one for birth defects, and one for cancer. Um, so um, uh, the point is, I think, that um, credible information from government agencies shows us that pesticides do cause health problems. Reason number three is that um, children are uh, particularly uh, susceptible to the effects of pesticides. And I know that um, Sarah will be talking a lot about this um, uh, in the next presentation, so I'll go very fast. Um, kids, um, for their size, drink more and eat more. Um, the way they act exposes them to pesticides. Um, also, kids are growing and developing, so pesticides can impact them at very vulnerable stages. Uh, reason number four, pesticides often contaminate food. Um, and this is data from the US Department of Agriculture that every year um, tests uh, commonly eaten fruits and vegetables um, for uh, pesticide residues. And um, you can see um, from this pie chart that you know, roughly 60% of the samples that they tested in 2019 um, contain pesticide residues. And most of them contain more than one pesticide. There were some samples that had up to 20 different pesticides. Um, so here's just a few examples. Um, tangerines, 99% of them had at least one pesticide. Um, Canned spinach, um, which we all know is supposed to be good for us, right? 98% um, of the samples um, had at least one pesticide. Okay, reason number five, pesticides are hazardous for farmers and farm workers. Um, clearly, um, farm workers are on the front lines of agricultural pesticide use and heavily exposed. Um, I just um, wanna mention a recent study done at um, the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, they studied mothers in agricultural areas of California and um, risks of brain tumors in their children um, as much as doubled when certain pesticides were applied nearby. Um, I think we often don't think about that when we're buying uh, food in the grocery store, but it's worth thinking about. Um, in terms of impacts on farmers' health, there's a, a long-term study that's been going on for decades called the Agricultural Health Study, and they found numerous health problems uh, linked to pesticide use by farmers. Um, the newest study this year uh, found a link between use of certain pesticides and thyroid cancer in farmers. Um, reason number six, pesticides are hazardous to pets. So uh, one thing that has been clear year after year is that pesticides actually poison pets. Um, there's a, a pet poison control center that keeps track of pet, pet poisoning incidents and um, insecticides and rodenticides are always in their top 10 list. Um, this year, insecticides are number nine and rodenticides are number seven. Rodenticides are pesticides used to kill um, rats and mice, things like that. Um, there was a lot of publicity this year about um, flea collars and this particular brand of flea collar, Ceresto, it was linked to um, hundreds of pet deaths and thousands of illnesses. Um, an important hazard of pesticides is that they often contaminate water. And um, we are fortunate that the US Geological Survey has been monitoring um, streams and rivers in the US um, for decades for pesticides. And um, in their most recent sort of review, um, they said that you know, pesticide contamination was found in 90% of the streams that they 
sampled and in all land uses, that means whether it was urban, agricultural, forest, but um, pesticides are hazardous to fish, birds, bees, just about any other animal that you can think of. Um, there's uh, a lot less information about this than there is about human health hazards. Um, but again, I was gonna go through um, those three widely used chemicals that I mentioned earlier. So glyphosate Roundup, for example, um, according to the GHS um, hazard statements, which is kind of an, an international um, labeling system, Glyphosate is toxic to aquatic life with long lasting effects. Um, Asaphate, the insecticide I mentioned is, um, this comes from the uh, US EPA, highly toxic to honeybees, beneficial insects, and um, also risky for birds and mammals. Um, chlorothalonil has the same um, hazard GHS hazard statement as glyphosate, very toxic to aquatic life with long lasting effects. Um, and while we're talking about all those creatures uh, that share our planet with us, I have to mention Rachel Carson, who is basically the person who inspired all of our work. And um, it was really the effects on the natural world that prompted her concern about pesticides. So big thank you to Rachel Carson. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the more um, sort of regulatory issues around pesticides. Um, so um, people often think that um, the government tests pesticides and that's really not true. Um, most pesticide health and safety testing is done by the actual companies that make and sell pesticides. Um, so Here's um, the five biggest pesticide companies in the world. They are the companies that profit from the sale of pesticides. Who tests pesticides? The same companies. Um, so it's kind of a built-in conflict of interest in my opinion. And finally, reason number 10, pesticides have too many secrets. And this is kind of a, a complicated um, story, so I'm gonna try to condense it, make it really simple. But it, for the most part, we don't know um, where pesticides are applied, when they're applied, or what is being applied. Um, and even if we, do, if we know, we don't know what's in the pesticides. So um, in too many secrets. I wanted to end the presentation with a little bit of good news. Um, I know that I've gone through a lot of pesticide hazards and you're gonna hear about a lot of good news um, in the rest of the conference, but just one statistic to take home with you. Um, eight out of 10 Americans buy organic food according to a recent survey, um, at least occasionally. So um, that's, that's good news. Um, and finally, just the take home message, um, we don't need pesticides. So let's do what we can to um, reduce and eliminate their use. Thank you. Let's welcome Dr. Sarah Evans, Assistant Professor, Environmental Medicine and Public Health, Institute for Exposomic Research, Icon School of Medicine, New York City. Thank you so much for having me. I'm an assistant professor in environmental medicine and public health at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And we are so thrilled to be co-convening this forum with Beyond Pesticides for the second time. And today I'm going to expand on Carolyn's point number three and take a deeper dive into the evidence that shows us that pesticides impact health, particularly for children and a little bit about what we can do about that. So at Mount Sinai, I'm part of a team of scientists and clinicians in the Institute for Exposomics Research, where we're innovating scientific methods with the goal of uncovering the links between early life environmental exposures and health um, in order to both prevent and treat chronic illnesses. 
And to increase the impact of our research, we work as a multidisciplinary team, which brings together researchers, healthcare providers, community members, and decision makers to promote safer practices and policies. So uncovering the role of environment and child health has become increasingly urgent as chronic diseases like asthma, diabetes, allergies, childhood cancer, and developmental disabilities have been steadily increasing over the past two decades. And so not only are these rates rising faster than can be accounted for by genetics, we know from studies of identical twins where one twin goes on to develop a disease or a disorder and the other does not, that nearly all diseases have an environmental component. And so our research shows us that children are not just little bit little adults, um, and you heard about this um, a bit from Carolyn, um, but the exposures that they're contributing are likely, or that they're experiencing are likely contributing um, to the development of diseases across their life course. So because of their unique physiology, they're disproportionately exposed to pesticides and more vulnerable to their health impacts. They're closer to the ground where pesticides settle in dust and soil, they're more likely to put their hands and other objects in their mouths, and they breathe faster than adults, which puts them at greater risk for inhalational exposures. They also eat a less varied diet, um, so often foods that are shown to have higher pesticide residues, and they eat and drink more for their body weight than adults. And so all these normal behaviors likely account for the finding that children experience higher exposure to pesticides and other chemicals than adults do. And we know that the chemicals that we're using in our homes and on our lawns are getting into our bodies. So the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey or NHANES is a study that the CDC conducts every other year on a representative sample of the US population. And they find more than 200 chemicals in the blood or the urine of nearly all Americans. So this is proof that the chemicals that we're using do get into our body through either ingestion or inhalation or skin absorption. And many of these exposures are higher in children for the reasons that I outlined. But like many toxic environmental exposures, black and brown communities also experience a disproportionate burden of exposure to pesticides. And this is due partly to failures to protect workers from occupational exposures, but also due to practices of environmental racism. So these are practices that have deliberately failed to protect these populations from toxic exposures and excluded them from decision-making related to the environment. A recent report published by the Black Institute, who you will hear from later in this meeting, found greater application of pesticides like glyphosate in parks located in communities of color compared to white communities. And so despite the fact that these exposures are so widespread, understanding the health impacts of the cumulative low dose long-term exposures is really challenging. So to truly solve this problem of how environment is shaping health, we're moving beyond measuring single exposures at a time, which is not how we experience them. So as Carolyn mentioned, for example, many types of produce are contaminated with more than one pesticide residue. And we're moving to studying mixtures of exposures across the life course in the context of our genetic and social background. And we do this by considering what we call the exposome, which is the totality of all of our external and, exposure, and internal exposures um, throughout the course of our life. And so when we're looking at exposures across the lifespan using this exposomics framework, we see that some of the greatest impacts um, occur when exposures occur during um, fetal development as well as early life. And so we refer to these as windows of susceptibility because these are periods of time where developing systems are most sensitive to perturbation as they change and grow. Um, so for example, studies have identified windows of susceptibility for the organochlorine pesticide DDT where exposures during the prenatal and prepubertal periods um, are associated with increased risk of premenopausal breast cancer. We also have evidence that pesticide exposure may impact your health even before you were conceived. So for example, recent data shows that DDT exposure that was experienced by your grandmother when she was pregnant with your mother can actually impair your own risk of developing breast cancer later in life. So even though DDT was banned for use in the US in 1972, it leaves behind this toxic legacy through inheritance. And this phenomenon of what we call transgenerational inheritance is not unique to pesticides, but it's been demonstrated for other chemicals um, and non-chemical exposures as well. And so an example of where this applies to, um, sorry, <laughs> um, our environmental health and, um, and 
uh, exposomics research is also taking into account individual differences in how we respond to chemical exposures uh, based on our internal makeup and also other exposures that we may experience. And so an example of this um, for pesticides can be seen in genetic differences in how we process organophosphate pesticides. So organophosphates are broken down in the liver by an enzyme called PON1. And there are different versions of the PON1 gene that differ in how well they process organophosphates. Individuals who inherit um, a less active version of PON1 are less able to process organophosphates. And the, um, this results in a buildup of toxic metabolites. And so the presence of this less active version of PON1 coupled with exposure to organophosphates is associated with increased risk of learning and behavior problems and neurode neurodegenerative diseases. And so when I speak to communities, people are often shocked to learn that there's an abundance of scientific evidence demonstrating the toxicity of the pest control chemicals that we use in our homes on a regular basis. And I really don't blame them for making this assumption um, because we think if it's on the shelf, it must be safe for our families and for our pets and for the environment. Oops. But unfortunately, uh, Carolyn already alluded to the fact that the majority of the over 1 billion pounds of pesticides that are applied in the US each year with 70 million pounds estimated to be applied across an 88 million homes and gardens um, show that there are both human and environmental toxicity um, associated with the use of these, chem these chemicals. Um, and so, for example, the most commonly applied herbicides in this country, 2,4-D and glyphosate are associated with cancer, neurotoxicity and hormone disruption. And we have strong evidence for an increased risk of neurodegenerative diseases, heart disease and stroke and some cancers in agricultural workers who are exposed to higher levels of pesticides than the general population. But when we think about the, um, the general population who are typically exposed to lower levels, what are, what are the health outcomes that we're seeing? And so we're seeing outcomes, particularly in children who are exposed to much lower levels of pesticides than an agricultural worker, um, with a number of studies supporting a link between things like impaired neurodevelopment and increased risk of childhood cancers. So just to touch on a few examples of studies that find exposure to pesticides during pregnancy and early childhood associations with impairments in cognition and behavior. Um, a study by Columbia researchers found not only changes in behavior in children exposed to organophosphates, um, but also changes in brain structure by MRI. And organophosphates have been banned largely for residential use due to these neurotoxic effects. But in many cases, they've been replaced by pyrethroid and neonicotinoid pesticides. Unfortunately, these replacements are also proving to be harmful to the developing nervous system with studies showing decreased IQ and behavioral problems in exposed children. None of this is really too surprising. So biologically, it makes sense that we would see impacts on the developing brain from pesticide exposure because many insecticides are designed to be toxic to the nervous system. So um, we, we have supporting laboratory studies that have identified precise mechanisms by which pesticides like chlorpyrifos, pyrethroids, neonicotinoids can actually disrupt communication between, between nerve cells, likely contributing to some of these behavioral um, and cognitive effects that we see in children. So there's also strong evidence linking high level occupational exposures to pesticides to increase cancer risk. Uh, but we also have evidence that pesticide exposures increase risk to childhood cancers. And I mentioned early that, earlier that DDT exposure before puberty is associated with increased risk of premenopausal breast cancer. Um, we also see associations between pesticide exposures um, and cancers that onset during childhood, like um, childhood brain tumors, leukemia and lymphoma, um, and leukemia and lymphoma. Um, and as Carolyn mentioned, um, in studies of agriculture workers and um, farm communities, we see a higher risk of these childhood cancers. And we also see this in studies um, where mothers report using insecticides and herbicides during pregnancy. So it's not just the active ingredients in a pesticide that can have health effects. In some cases, um, the active ingredient actually comprises less than 1% of the total formulation. Um, and greater than 99% may be made up of other proprietary or secret ingredients. Um, and so the pesticide synergist piperineal butoxide or PBO is a great example um, of a sort of inactive ingredient having potentially more harmful 
um, effects than the active ingredient in the pesticide. And so PBO is added to many pesticides, um, particularly pyrethroid pesticides to enhance potency. And PBO is not only a possible human carcinogen, um, prenatal exposure is also associated with increased risk of respiratory problems and impaired, develop, uh, impaired neurodevelopment. We're also concerned about exposure to mixtures, uh, mixtures of chemicals within a pesticide formulation. And so animal studies um, are showing that the full formulation of some glyphosate based herbicides like Roundup may have uh, greater adverse health effects than exposure to just the active ingredient and gly uh, the active ingredient glyphosate alone, um, pointing to the need to really examine mixtures when we're testing pesticides for toxicity. And so I just told you a little bit about the direct impacts of pesticide exposures on child health, um, but we're also thinking beyond those direct impacts to consider the indirect impacts that wide scale pesticide use are having um, through impacts on climate change. And so pest control needs are changing along with the changing climate. For example, there's an increased need for tick and mosquito, mosquito control measures um, as their active seasons become longer and pesticides are affecting soil and ocean biodiversity, um, two things that act as major carbon sinks and as their capacity to absorb carbon from the environment um, is impaired, we're seeing an acceleration of the climate crisis. Um, and then lastly, the production of the more than 1 billion pounds of pesticides that are applied each year in the US alone requires massive amounts of petroleum, energy and water to produce. So we see pesticides indirectly contributing to a myriad of health issues that are associated with climate change. Um, things like heat illness, increased allergy and respiratory problems, more um, insect borne diseases like Lyme disease, health impacts of extreme weather and loss of the food supply. And here again, um, just as we see with chemical exposures, we see that climate change is having disproportionate impacts on the health of both children, as well as black and brown communities. So the good news um, is that there is scientific evidence to support simple steps to reduce pesticide exposures. So in addition to simply not using them on your own property, and Carolyn gave great examples of how you can solve pesticide problems without synthetic chemicals, um, we have studies that show that taking simple steps like removing your shoes at the door, washing your hands, keeping a dust-free home, and choosing foods that are grown without pesticides can all effectively reduce your personal exposures. Because many of the pesticides that we're using today leave the body relatively quickly, making small behavioral changes like the ones I just described can help to rapidly reduce your pesticide body burden. But an even more effective way to affect change is to, re to um, reduce exposures on a broader level by using your power as a consumer. And again, Caroline alluded to um, the massive market share that the organic industry is now taking um, and the increase in availability of organic foods uh, has happened really largely due to where people are choosing to spend their money. And then lastly, stronger regulations have been shown to effectively reduce pesticide exposures at the population level. So after the neurotoxic pesticide chlorpyrifos was banned for residential use, children in New York City communities where it had previously been used saw a tenfold reduction in exposure levels. So I also like to end on the good news. Um, and so we're seeing an increasing number of communities that are implementing legislative and voluntary pesticide bans. Most recently, thanks to many of the scientists and activists who are participating in this forum, New York City and Philadelphia passed bills that will greatly reduce or eliminate the application of synthetic pesticides in public parks and properties. So this is a great success um, and they're really paving the way for other communities. Um, we're also seeing um, US organic sales in 2019 that were over $50 billion. Um, as I mentioned, many of the chemicals that we're using today, although they are associated with health effects, are lower in their persistence in their environment and how long um, they last in the body. And we can rapidly reduce our exposure through things like organic diet. 
And then lastly, I just want to highlight that our research in exposomics is really showing us how positive exposure, so things like good nutrition, physical activity, access to green spaces, um, a safe and supportive community can all mitigate some of the risks of, of harmful chemical exposures like pesticides. And that concludes my presentation. So if you would like to learn more about the work that we do and get more information on creating healthier environments, you can find us online or follow us on social media. And I thank you for your time and attention today. And I hope you will join us for the rest of the forum. Thank you. Let's welcome Melinda Himmelgarn, board member beyond pesticides, registered dietitian, host of Food Sleuth Radio, Columbia, Missouri. Thank you so much. Uh, the two presentations preceding this one lay the perfect groundwork for what I'm going to be addressing today. I'm a registered dietitian by training, and so consumers come to me asking about what kinds of foods they should purchase. Should they buy organic, even though it's quote unquote more expensive? And they also come to me with a lot of exposure to pesticide industry information. And the pesticide industry has also infiltrated my professional association that also flavors the messages that we give. So I live in the Midwest. This is where a lot of commodity corn and soy is grown. We have a lot of exposure to pesticides and herbicides here. So I am going to take this section of our pre-conference and wrap it up with looking at media literacy as it's applied to pesticide messaging. I became involved in media literacy back when I was doing work on, on childhood obesity prevention, realizing that media was this big elephant in the room and was influencing the foods that children wanted to eat. And I thought we could use these same critical thinking strategies to look at pesticide messaging as well. So that's what we'll do today. So why does media matter exactly? And I think Jim Dickinson, who was the editor of the FDA Review, summed it up nicely when he said, the issue here is really the media's role in the framing of public opinion when it comes to just about everything, including pesticides. The former FCC chairman, Reed Hunt, took this a step further and he said the media's significance and clout comes from its near ubiquitous pervasive power to completely alter the belief of every American. Keep in mind, he said this before Facebook, before Twitter, before all of the social media outlets. And if you think about it, we really swim in media messages and it's really important that we learn how to navigate them. I mean, we really can't even pump gas anymore without seeing a screen in front of us. We have to understand too that media both reflects and creates cultural norms and narratives. So if you open up a conventional farming magazine, say Successful Farming, uh, farm, Farming Today, you'll see many advertisements that look at the farmer in opposition to nature. It's man against weeds. And there are many products to help the farmer escape weed pressure, which is growing because of resistance. Here's another sample of advertisements putting the farmer in the position of needing to fight nature, to fight weeds. So there's a, the, these ads are rife with fighting words. And the ad at the very bottom you'll see is um, actually a pledge of a farmer to say that he will use multiple herbicide applications to take care of resistant weeds. Driving down a road in rural Arkansas, we learn that farmers need dicamba, which is one of the more dangerous herbicides that has been added to the mix with glyphosate to help uh, stop resistant weeds, especially in soy crops. It's led to lots of loss of crop damage, loss of orchards, as well as a murder in this region of the country over drift damage. So yard signs, highway signs, billboards, that counts as media too. Farmers are told that, hey, you gotta use herbicides if you wanna get the weeds out of your field and that weeds are likened to dirt or trash. And these are the kind of images that farmers receive in farming publications. Who doesn't wanna make more money as a farmer? Farmers are struggling. You can make more money using these kinds of herbicides. 
There's also this underlying message that farmers feed the world and they need herbicides to do so. They need the technology that these agribusiness giants bring them. There's even, there are products like belt buckles and caps, and here's a rifle that actually has a message saying American farmers are feeding the world. Crop Life America and their ambassador program brings curriculum into children's classrooms, telling them about the hazards of weeds, how they can destroy crops, and that how these herbicides are helping not only to fight weed damage, but to also feed the planet Earth. Consumers are taught to expect perfection in the produce aisle, and the way farmers deliver perfection is with sprays. Even farmers at my local market will say that they don't want to bring produce with blemishes to the marketplace because they don't think consumers will buy it. Herbicides for healthy lawns. I can't tell you how many promotional mailers I've received from True Green this year already saying that they'll come over for free, assess my lawn, assess my soil, and that they have a healthy lawn guarantee. Many of the images show families on the lawn, children on the lawn playing. Public relations firms are responsible for creating incredibly persuasive and effectively um, motivational messages to get us to change our behavior. So I just pulled off a couple of quotes from some of these PR firms. Porter Novelli, for example, they say, we motivate people to change deeply ingrained behaviors rooted in cultural and social norms. Our results are greater than influencing people. We make them believe. Catch them works with a lot of food companies. They say, we help food executives build trust and enhance the bottom line. So faced with these kinds of effective marketing campaigns and messages, keep this in mind, two critical thinkers, two quotes. Sophocles said, what people believe prevails over truth. I think we've been living this nightmare for the past year. And then Mark Twain, a Missouri boy, says, you know, it's easier to fool people than to convince them that they have been fooled. And that one bears repeating. It's easier to fool people than to convince them that they've been fooled. So with that in mind, we need media literacy because media literacy helps us from being fooled in the first place. What does it do? It teaches us to access analyze, evaluate, create, and act using all forms of communication. And ultimately, it will empower people to be critical thinkers, effective communicators, and active citizens. And I encourage everyone in the public health community and beyond, teachers, reaching youth with media literacy education is extremely important. Children in particular do not like being duped. So the National Association for Media Literacy Education is a great resource. So with media literacy, there are several tenets, and one is that we have to ask critical questions. For example, we need to know who owns or benefits or profits from the message that we're receiving. So for example, dietitians receive information all the time from Bayer, who of course purchased Monsanto, and they tell us, hey, if you've got questions about pesticides and food, we've got the answers. Well, getting back to Carolyn's point, there's a little bit of conflict of interest there. Would we want to get answers from a company that profits from those answers? Here's a, a series of ads at the bottom. This is from the Alliance for Food and Farming. It's a name that you wouldn't necessarily connect with a pesticide industry. This is a group that is that represents the produce industry. And the produce industry does not like messages that Sarah and Carolyn presented. They want us to believe that we shouldn't be fearful of pesticides, that pesticides are necessary to produce healthy and affordable produce on the table. Note who is delivering these messages. Note how we look at trust, the mother and child combination. What about places like GMO Answers? Who owns that? How do we tell if we're being greenwashed? We need to be able to find out who is behind the message. Now, I am going to identify three sources that I like to use quite a, deal, quite a bit in finding out 
who is behind the message. We want to know what front groups are out there. We want to know trade associations. We want to know about their funding. We want to know what kind of policies they get behind. So Spinning Food is a report that was done by Friends of the Earth, Anna LaPay, and Stacey Malkin at US Right to Know. If you open up one of the pages, you'll see the top front groups listed. You'll see how much money they have to spend. You'll see who their, their funders are and what their main focus is. There's a new group based in Washington, D.C. called Feed the World, and they just released a report called Draining the Big, the Big Food Swamp. They have identified trade associations, their members, how much money they have to spend, and their strategies. And also, I love the Center for Media and Democracy, their source watch. You can get behind these messages. It's also important to pay attention to who is the actor that was selected to deliver the message. So understand that all media messages are scripted. There's nothing by hap nothing happens by chance. So the individual in Farm Journal who's here presenting information saying, I will use herbicides, he looks just like a farmer down the road from me. This is what a Midwestern farmer looks like. So it's people like us delivering the message that's more effective. This was in the Farm Journal. You'd expect to see an ad there. But what about this ad here, America's Farmers Grow America? This banner was actually at the Foggy Bottom Metro Station in Washington, DC. Not a place where you'd expect to see a lot of farmers unless perhaps they're coming in for a, a you know legislative fly-in. But this is where a lot of policymakers will pass through and they'll get the message. And there's a little logo here showing Monsanto so you know who owns that message. Again, looking at this Alliance for Food and Farming, Moms Deserve the Truth, you can see this very powerful mother-daughter relationship building trust. Moms deserve to know the truth. We can give you that truth and that we want to use facts but not fear to relay those messages. Now, after hearing Sarah and Carolyn's presentation, I think we have every reason to be fearful of these poisons in our environment, and we should take steps to avoid them. We want to know what persuasive techniques are used to get us to buy a particular product, whether it's a pesticide or a food product, a soft drink, regardless. So there are different ways in which propaganda is used. And this propagandacritic.com site is excellent for exposing the tools and strategies used against us. Simple, easy solutions and incentives are great ways to get us to change our behaviors. Remember the farmer that looks just like us. These are plain folks. Testimonials delivered by plain folks or celebrities are quite effective. Here you can see on the right where farmers are actually given a $6 per acre rebate for using the, the herbicide. Uh, nostalgia is very, very important. We saw that in the last presidential election. You know, we were gonna make America great again. That's the use of nostalgic propaganda. What about emotion? Nine billion people on the earth. Oh my gosh, we've gotta feed them. How are we gonna do that? Monsanto has the answers, of course. Where was this located? This again was in the Washington DC airport. Bandwagoning is a term that's used to describe people not wanting to be separate from the group. So if all of the farmers down the road are using this particular product, we're going to use it too. If all of my neighbors are using True Green to have monoculture green lawns, we're more likely to use them as well. And then of course we have this scientific support where we show scientists, people we can trust saying, hey, Herbicides are fine, they're well tested, and they don't harm other crops, which we've seen actually to the contrary. We're dealing with a lot of drift damage on specialty crops, fruits and vegetables that dietitians recommend that we eat more of. One of the other questions we have to ask in media literacy is what's missing from the message? So all of the issues that both Sarah and Caroline mentioned, those are missing issues. Unintended consequences. What happens to our pollinators? What happens to the water, the creeks and rivers where we want to swim and play? What if my son wants to go fishing? Would it be okay if he ate that fish? What about the quality of water where farm children live? Is it contaminated with pesticides or nitrates? What about drift damage? 
farmers that want to have a wine crop or grow fruits and vegetables, as, we're heal, as we'll hear later in the conference, we'll hear it from farmers who have struggled with drift damage and they can't make a living anymore. What about farm worker health? So much of the message is, is dedicated to what's on our own individual plates, but really we have to think beyond our plate and say, what about the farmers who are being exposed to these chemicals? What about unborn children? This was a tragic story. It was written up in, in the media in Florida, as well as Barry Estabrook in Tomatoland. Here's a child, Carlitos, who was born to a woman who worked in Agrimart's tomato fields in Immokalee in North Carolina, and she gave birth to a child that was born without arms and legs. These stories are missing from mainstream media. We need to know that these are happening in relation to the information that we heard from Sarah and Carolyn. In media literacy, we understand that words matter. There was a wonderful interview by Eddie, with Eddie Ellis at the uh, former Black Panther in the Sun Magazine in July 2013. And what he said was to change people's thinking and behaviors, we have to change the language that they use. So think about how the language has changed. Do we use the word pesticides or do we switch over to crop protection? Chemlon or True Green? There's been a name change. What about the National Agricultural Chemicals Association? They changed their name to Crop Life America. And what about modern agriculture? What is that exactly? Well, modern agriculture in my neck of the woods means instead of using just one herbicide, you're gonna use two. And it's likened to using a shovel to using a snowblower. When DuPont and Dow merged and created Corteva, they used two words, heart from Latin and nature from Hebrew. So you can see that the science behind the terminology and the language is really critical to our acceptance or not. Monsanto says that they're modern and also that they work or bond with mother nature. Syngenta's Thrive Magazine, available to farmers as well as online, they say that their ambition is to help safely feed the world while taking care of the planet. You see a lot of this imagery of hands holding soil. Farmers are the original environmentalists, they tell us and that with Syngenta's help, we can support the environment and decrease production costs. Nothing about public health. So what is our job? As for those of us who work in, regardless of the field, public health, education, uh, neighbor to neighbor, our job is to expose the emperors. And it's really hard to do this when you're a lone voice. Right. Remember the little boy, the lone person who spoke up and said the emperor doesn't have clothes, even though there was overwhelming evidence. So I love this quote by George Bernard Shaw. He says, we must speak about things as they are, not as they are said to be, even when we're the lone voice. So good news. Also, what are we going to do to influence the narrative? I think that those of us who work in health fields, have a responsibility not only to translate the science, but to complement it with stories and art. And there are wonderful ways that we can do this. So here's Dave Vetter in Nebraska. He is an organic farmer. He is surrounded by farmers who use chemicals. His organic status is actually at risk because of it. He has a sign on his, on his property. It says, how your food is produced does matter. There's been a documentary made about him Stories matter. Telling stories are more powerful than sharing statistics. We need the science, we need the statistics, but when we're translating, we need the stories behind those numbers. There's Matt Willie, who's painting pollinators all over the country to help tell the story of pollinator loss. What did Bob Dylan sing in All Along the Watchtower? Don't talk falsely now, the hour is getting late one of the finest poets. Go to Poetry Slams, tell your stories there. What about the artwork of Rob Shetterly, who did a portrait series of Americans who tell the truth, showing portraits and pull quotes from individuals like Rachel Carson uh, to, to speak out for environmental and social justice. 
Chris Jordan is the m marvelous photographer who went to Midway Island and took photographs of albatross birds who had died because of plastic that they've ingested. He could give you the statistics on plastic pollution in the, uh, in the ocean, but it is much more powerful to show that image of the dead bird. Put a, a pesticide is free zone in your yard, which is what I do, so that people who walk by my garden see that you can have these beautiful flowers without poisons. Um, and then podcasts are huge right now. Tune into the radio, and I'm gonna do a personal plug and just ask you to tune into Food Sleuth Radio where you will hear from many of the speakers at this excellent forum, as well as many more tell their stories and, and really speak the truth, connect the dots, fill in the puzzle pieces and amplify the truth. So with that, I'm going to thank everyone for attending, thank my fellow presenters. It's an honor to be on this panel with you and also welcome you to enjoy the rest of the forum. Thank you.